Good morning. And happy Easter. I'll invite you all to look in your bulletin to the Easter greeting. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. So we are grateful that you are here today to hear the good news, that Jesus is alive and that death has been defeated. Now just a few announcements before we begin our time of worship. So we are serving communion today from the pews. And if you did not pick up a packet on your way in, an usher can help you to get one. So just a note, and I'll remind you as we get closer to communion, but you'll hold your wine and your wafer through the words of institution and the Lord's Prayer. And then I will invite you to partake in the elements after the Lord's Prayer. Thank you to Caleb, who is providing our piano music for today. We are particularly grateful because it was kind of a last-minute request that we had of him. So early uh, last week, it became apparent that Jean Hellner's 91-year-old mother um, was coming to the end of her time on this earth. So Jean traveled on Wednesday afternoon to Wisconsin to be with her mom and siblings. And I received word yesterday that Jean's mom died on Good Friday. And so the whole family is grateful for your prayers during this time. A thank you to those who helped us to decorate our sanctuary with flowers. And please feel free after the service to take the flowers that you ordered. We do have a checklist in the sanctuary to let Altar Guild know who has picked up their flowers. And also in our entryway table, we have an usher sign up and then a sign up for the Dorothy Day House uh, meal. And finally, yes, I'm still here with you all today, and I'm feeling good, but also very pregnant. <laughs> um, so I'm actually headed to the hospital tomorrow morning for an induction. So for those of you who maybe don't know, um, my blood pressure has been on the high side, but stable, and so I made a deal with my doctor. If I could keep it stable, she would let me stay pregnant through Easter. And so because I love you all so much, I did not eat nearly as much chocolate as I would have liked to these last few weeks, and I ate a lot more spinach salad than I would have cared to do. But um, I appreciate your prayers as we will be headed to the hospital uh, tomorrow morning to be induced uh, to have this baby boy. We'll share news via the email and then also in worship next Sunday. And then just a reminder, we have wonderful pastors who will be covering during my eight weeks away. So... With that, let's take a moment to center our hearts and minds on God through our worship today. Will you please rise for the confession and forgiveness as you are able? Alleluia! Christ is risen! Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. A new day is before us. Let us confess our sins before God and one another so we can make a fresh start on this glorious resurrection day. Risen one, we are merely human. We cannot make sense of the resurrection gift. We linger in places of death. We are startled, overcome, speechless, and unbelieving by turns. Forgive us when we are unable to grasp new life with both hands and extend it to us all over again. Amen. In Christ's name, the risen Christ, the living one, I announce to you that God's love is stronger than death. You are forgiven. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson for this morning comes to us from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, 
Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. I invite you to join me on the bolded verses of our responsive psalm. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our second reading for this morning comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it on to you as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, As to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This time we'll have a musical reflection from Paula. In letters of crimson, God wrote his love on a hillside so long, long ago. For you and for me, Jesus died and loved. Greatest story was told. I love you. I love you. That's what Calvary
of you written in red down through the ages God wrote his love with the same hands that suffered and Giving all that he had to give a message so easily read. I love you. I What Calvary said, I love you, I love you, I love you. Once upon his back he knew this was the beginning of the end. With every fragile step he grew more and more determined to finish it. The world saw a man with a tree on his back and they laughed. But God saw his son whom he loved 
carry more than that. Oh, he didn't just carry the cross, he carried me. He didn't just count the cost, he counted me. So much has been said of what happened at Calvary. Oh, but I believe didn't just carry the cross, he carried me. Mercy held my broken heart close against his shoulders as he wept. Love beyond a moment scarred the hands and feet of one I've never met. The world saw a man die a martyr between two thieves. But God saw a lamb bridge the gap to eternity. Just carry the cross, he carried me. He didn't just count the cost, he counted me. So much has been said of what happened at Calvary. Oh, but I believe he didn't just carry the cross. He carried me. So much has been said of what happened at Calvary, oh, but I believe he didn't just carry a cross, oh, no, he didn't just carry a cross, no, he didn't just carry a cross. Carried me. He carried me. Will you please rise as you are able as we greet the gospel? The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter 
that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now, I am continually struck at how this day, this most joyous day of celebration in the Christian church, is a day that actually began before we knew there was a reason to celebrate. It starts in the darkness. It starts just as the sun was beginning to rise. It starts with women preparing to finish the death ritual. And that draws me in. This is a day for celebration, but it's also a day that we remember death comes before life. Or said another way, a seed needs to be planted to die in the ground before a flower shoots forth. Or a metaphor that I'm very aware of right now, a pregnancy must die, it must end, so that a baby can be born. So death comes before life. Good Friday comes before Easter. Now that can sometimes be something that's uncomfortable for us to hold on to. It's more somber than we expect Easter to be. But yet, that is how Easter began. And what an important promise for us to hold on to this year in particular, as we've seen deaths of loved ones, as we've held on to the promise of life everlasting, and as we've seen the death of rituals, traditions, our normal way of being in this world, and we've looked all over for new life, for new ways to be. I wonder what it was like for those first women that first Easter morning. I wonder if Mary Magdalene and James's mother Mary and Salome, if they had that nervous, anxious energy. I think you all know what I'm talking about. That energy that just makes you say, well, now what? We thought Jesus was going to save us, and he died. I wonder if they were restless and anxious and felt they just had to go do something. Did they pace around their house saying, what can we do? I wonder if they decided, well, the only thing that's left for us to do is to apply those spices to complete the ritual. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, we're drawn into the story. So it's as if we're walking right alongside the women as we overhear their anxiety and restlessness, wondering, well, there's a large stone in front of the tomb. How are we even going to get in? They knew that they may not get in, but still they, know, they knew they needed to go do something. But when they arrived at the tomb that first Easter morning, they received the most unexpected good news. The stone was rolled away. The grave was empty. There was nothing to do except to go and tell the disciples, Christ is not dead. He is raised. Now we're going to come back to that in just a minute but I want to repeat it so you can hold on to it for later. There is nothing for you to do except proclaim, Christ is not dead, he is raised. Now, beginning in Advent, we've worked our way through the Gospel of Mark, hearing the very first words, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And week after week, we've moved with intensity through the Gospel, so Mark has this rapid intensity about him that builds throughout the gospel. It sweeps us like a snowball rolling down a hill until we get to this very final story. And did you notice how it ended? Verse 8. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had, its, had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's how the gospel ends. That's it. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. 
So we have this rapid intensity in the Gospel of Mark. It's hurrying us to the culmination of this book, to Jesus' death and his resurrection. And then it just seems to fall off a cliff and end. Except it doesn't really end there, does it? It can't be the end. Otherwise, this story would have ended, would have died alongside the women. We know the story doesn't end. We know that the women eventually did tell the disciples, who told others, who told others, who then throughout the generations eventually told us. And the story continues. We too share the good news. Christ is not here. He is alive. Death has been defeated. The gospel seems to end so abruptly, leaving us wondering, now what? Because the ending isn't really an ending at all. It's just the beginning. The story isn't over. When Mark wrote the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, he wasn't meaning the opening story of the gospel. He meant the entirety of the gospel of Mark. Our lives continue the story that Mark began. Our lives are swept up in the momentum that Mark created to urgently share the good news because Jesus has called out to you and to me to follow. And so we follow. So you have the opportunity to contribute to God's story, to help God keep God's promises right here and right now, which means your prayer, your actions, your words, the things that you do are important. And what you do is not about attaining your own salvation, but about proclaiming the things that God has already done. So what you do has an impact on those that you meet. Which brings me back to those women that first Easter morning. They were nervous, racked with grief, needing something to do. And they found out there was only one thing left to go and do. Go and tell others. And remember how we are swept up in the story. So there's only one thing left for us to do, to go and tell others. What a life we have been given. What good news we have been called to share. Thanks be to God. Amen.
I invite you to rise as you are able as we confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So at this time, we'll transition to our time of communion. Just as a reminder, we'll do the words of institution and the Lord's Prayer, and then following that, we'll receive communion together. So on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it broken and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remember us in your kingdom. And teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. The congregation may be seated. And at this time, I'll invite you to take your wafer. And as you receive it, know that this is the body of Christ given for you. And then as you're ready, know that it is the blood of Christ shed for you. May the gift of Jesus' body and blood strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Let us pray. God of abundance, with his bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
and peace to love and serve the Lord.